Hi everyone, my name is Anna Rose. I'm the Exhibition and Programming Associate at the Venom Museum. Thanks so much for tuning in today for Cold War Spaces. Today's topic is olfactory space, Chanel number no. five and Red Mosca. And our guest today is Karl Schlegel. He's an award-winning writer and historian. He's Professor Emeritus of um, Eastern European History at the European U University of the Adrena in Frankfurt and der Oder, Germany. He's the author of numerous books focusing on Soviet and Eastern European history, including Moscow 1937, Ukraine, a nation on the borderland, and In Space We Read Time on the history of civilization and geopolitics. His recently published book, The Scent of Empires, Chanel Number no. 5 and Red Moscow, was just published, and that will be the topic of today's talk. Today's program will be about a 30-minute discussion between Carl and Nils Siegel, the Venda's chief curator and director of programming. After that, we'll leave about um, 15 minutes for Q&A, so please get your questions ready to put in the Q&A box during that time. Um, as always, we appreciate everyone's questions, but please keep them short and concise, no longer than a sentence or two. And for other comments, please use the chat box, which is open, um, and it's always nice if you say hi and what city you're tuning in from. And we'll be posting the recording of this program on our Vimeo page afterwards, and we'll also um, have it in podcast format on our SoundCloud page. Lastly, I'd like to thank Susan Horwitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting discussion series at the Venda and our virtual programs. And now you will get us started with the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Anna Rose. And Carl, welcome to Cold War Spaces. Great to have you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, can I uh, start with a very blunt uh, question? What uh, makes a historian of Soviet and East European culture write a book about perfumes? Yeah, that's a good question because I'm not an expert on fragrances or scents or perfumes, but the idea is very simple. When I was uh, in the early 80s in Moscow, I had this experience that whenever I went to the theater or to a concert or to the opera or to a very solemn event in the university, inauguration ceremonies, there was a scent in the air. Mm -hmm. And I just realized it was a very warm uh, scent. And when I wrote my book on the archaeology of the Soviet civilization, I just wanted to write one page about this remarkable scent. But I realized, and I tried to find out what is the brand of this, and it was Red Moscow. Mm -hmm. And the first surprise was when I looked for uh, this brand, I got an information from Russian researchers and they told me that these, these scent, this fragrance at Moscow originated from prior times, pre-revolutionary times. It was created obviously in 1913 on the occasion of the third hundredth anniversary of the Romanov dynasty. And so this was a great surprise to, to see that there are continuities in creating fragrances and scents and to understand that this very popular, uh, this very popular uh, Soviet perfume, uh, which was uh, very popular among ladies and uh, prominent people, that this scent was created, had origins before the revolution. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, and but there were uh, several other surprising uh, things, and uh, I just brought uh, two narratives together. This is the story of of Red Moscow, the story of Red Moscow, and another story. And I never could imagine that two stories belong together: the story of Chanel Number no. Five and and Red Moscow. But this was uh, only the result of research, a lot of reading and looking around in the internet. And uh, yeah, this was the point of departure for looking for perfumes, fragrances for a historian who never had an idea about fragrance, scents, and <laughs> the history of, of perfumes. Yeah, it's such a wonderful and original topic. and. Um... 
Uh, you mentioned in your book that uh, the famous Chanel number no. five and Red Moscow actually have a common origin in Tsarist Russia. Can you briefly explain how that uh, worked? What was the yeah. common origin? Yeah. yeah, I had the story of the Russian line of uh, Red Moscow and I had the story of Chanel. And I just put them together and it, uh, it became clear that there, are, there is one origin, and I would say there are three or four points. At first, they, uh, it, they, this fragrance was created uh, by two French firms, companies working in the Russian Empire, by Raleigh and by Brocard. Uh, the, the perfume was created by two perfumers who had the same teacher uh, Alexandre Le Mercier, and both had experiences in create, working with aldehydes, a new chemical uh, substance, and both knew each other. The story how they are related, these perfumes, both perfumes, uh, is not uh, finally clear, and it is necessary to go into the archives of the Soviet uh, Perfume Trust to find out the 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 relations and the links but uh russian experts they that there is in any case uh in a very intimate relation between these uh the two perfumers uh ernest beau and auguste michel and uh even the the story of the bottles and the flacon is very very entangled or related to each other. Right. But the ways departed after the revolution. And so it's uh, not so easy to find out because Ernest Beau, after revolution and civil war, he uh, went back to, to France where he met uh, Gabriel Coco Chanel. And the other guy, uh, the perfumer uh, Auguste Michel, he uh, was forced to stay in Russia and he became one of the pioneers of the reconstruction of perfume industry in, in post-revolutionary Russia. Right. So I, I would like to um, ask you something about um, um, the history of scent and smell. I don't know that many historians that focus on this particular sense and of course there is the famous passage in Proust uh, à la recherche du temps perdu in the search of lost time where um, a meddling cake dipped in tea inspires a whole chain of personal memories but um, you actually make the point that historians in your words should uh, sniff around more in history and um, I'm curious to hear what do you think can historians uh, learn uh, from smell and what are the particular issues, methodological issues you are confronted with when you are focusing on smell as a source of historical research? Yeah, I think the idea that uh, smell is a very important sense is quite uh, elementary or e I would say even banal. For instance, living in a city like Berlin, uh, if you crossed from former West Berlin to East Berlin, there was a kind of change in the smell, in the scent scape of the city going from East to West and uh, the other way around. It was clear there are not only political divisions, political uh, a great divide in political terms, but also in scentscapes. And I think uh, there's a kind of, of hierarchy of senses, hierarchy of sense. We trust, especially historians trust, especially uh, paper documents, archival materials, printed uh, materials. We uh, trust our, our eyes, uh, the visual reality. We trust uh, what we hear, the soundscapes. And the other senses, taste and smell, and uh, to touch, uh, they are somehow underprivileged. And this has a very long tradition in European thinking, especially in the time of enlightenment, where the printed matter and the book and was uh, defining uh, a, kind, uh, a certain way 
the approach to reality. But if you look, uh, for instance, I tried to make it clear in some, uh, at some stages of the 20th century, if you write a, story, a history of the Russian Revolution, you just have to imagine to go to, to Petrograd in 1970. Uh, people, masses of soldiers, uh, peasants are flooding the city, are coming from the trenches, from the front, and they are going into the palaces, the landscapes of the aristocracy and the, the, the civil society to theaters, palaces, etc. They bring with them an entirely different sense yeah right. and and so to write a, a, a story of the russian revolution it's not only to write about the changing of political structures uh, the changing of elites it's a story of changing the the all dimensions of social reality and that has to do with the visual with what you can hear and what you can uh, what, what you can smell. So I, I'm just, I do not, uh, I do not say that history has to be reduced to sandscape. Yeah, but I'm for, uh, I'm saying we have to, to develop the repertoire of perceptions of the senses for, to, to understand the complexity of, of the real history. That's all. And it's it's very simple. And I mean, Mandelstam he was writing essays about the Shum Remini, about the about the noise of the time. You can also write about the scent of of the time, and you just have to go into story to the Russian Revolution. You have to go to the camps the of the of the Nazi time. You have to go to the Kolyma. All places have in a certain way also their atmosphere, their sandscapes. That's all, it's very easy. And I'm just saying we should take into account all our senses. Right, so you spoke about landscapes of the aristocracy and so now you could argue that perfume can be associated with social elitism, uh, maybe in the words of um, uh, communist uh, thinkers with bourgeois decadence, so that brings me to the question, what happened to the Russian perfume industry after the Russian Revolution, which after all was a workers' revolution? Was perfume seen as something from the elites or did it just continue? Yes, of course. Uh, perfume that was in most time uh, uh, a luxury good. It was right. only rich people could afford all these uh, French perfumes. There were accessories of, of well-to-do uh, people, and uh, uh, and the desire of the new regime and the desire of the masses after the revolution was to have uh, very elementary goods of of uh, public hygiene, for instance, uh, soap, uh, tooth uh, past, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so uh, after the end of the civil war, there was a kind of even a transitional period in sandscapes. You had on the other side, on one side, you had the remnants of the sandscape of the bourgeoisie, of uh, some bottles remaining in the bathrooms of the communal apartments. And you had a new sandscape, which was created in the communal apartment, which is different from the luxury apartments of, of the higher middle class. So you could say that in the 20s you have all you have even a struggle in the sandscape between I say the bourgeois sandscape and a new one uh, called uh, proletarian one. And it's changing only in the 30s when uh, the new class, which was uh, the result of the upward mobility, uh, in the industrialization and collectivization period, when this new class developed a new interest and desire to create their own specific luxury goods. And so in the 30s, we have a kind of comeback of, uh, 
of middle class values or middle class uh, um, uh, middle class uh, uh, tastes uh, in interiors in fashion and also in the in the in the in, in the perfume and cosmetics industry that actually brings me to my next question about Mikhail Bogakov, um, uh, whose um, uh, uh, novel you, you uh, describe in your book, uh, The Master and Margarita, famous novel. Uh, and I don't know if Red Moscow was uh, known at all in Paris, but apparently the other way around, Chanel number no. five was uh, well known in Moscow. So in a quite surreal scene um, uh, at a certain point, a red-haired um, uh, girl in a black evening dress starts to um, mention all the Parisian uh, perfume uh, brands, uh, including Chanel Number no. Five. And um, I wonder how you see uh, this passage in his book as a comment on what you just described: uh, changes in the um, social meaning of scent and perfume. Uh, I think it's only one page in the entire novel, but it's a central right. uh, scene in, in the in the book. And what I was uh, surprised uh, was the fact that uh, Bulgakov was uh, enumerating a number of uh, foreign of foreign perfumes, not only Chanel, but uh, Guerlain and and others. So it was for me, uh, I, I did not make a literary analysis, but uh, it was for me astonishing that he could count with the, as a reference point with his readers. His readers knew uh, obviously what is Chanel and what is Mitsuki and what is uh, Guerlain. So it was for me uh, the, the proof of the presence of these perfumes in the imagination of, of his readers. And it's quite right. clear from, from people like uh, uh, Aragon and others traveling back and forth or Mayakovsky to bring a gift from, from the capitalist West. One of the best gifts was always one of these, uh, of these uh, miraculous uh, and wonderful perfumes from Paris. Right. And I'm curious to hear how you interpret this particular scene. What uh, did Bogakov want uh, uh, to express with uh, this mentioning of all these uh, foreign perfumes? Um, uh, I, I have to say that uh, only after you said that there's even a black dress, <laughs> I never thought about this. Right. But uh, yeah. there is a black dress, uh, the black. Uh, uh, dress by it's it's it must not be the black dress of uh, Coco Chanel, but there was a parallel figure in the Soviet fashion world. This was uh, Nadezhda Lamanova, and if you look uh, through her designs for fashion for women, uh, it was very very close uh, to what uh, Chanel uh, created in, in the twenties, and in the West it was called the. The, the fortune of fashion, the fort of fashion, the mm -hmm. modern uh, fashion. And in a certain way, the Soviet avant-garde uh, and Nadezhda Lamanova and Alexandra Exter and, and others, they worked also um, and uh, had the intention to create something new, uh, fashion which is uh, more uh, which is emancipating from the uh, from the fin de siècle uh, design, which is practical, which is simple, which is which is um, uh, documenting the style of uh, the emancipated woman. So there are parallel moves uh, on both sides of the of the border. At that time, there was not a iron curtain. In the interwar time, right. there was a real and very intensive exchange, uh, quite intensive exchange between Moscow, Berlin, Paris, and, and other places. Absolutely. So, in what you could um, uh, call the central chapter, at least it's the longest chapter in your book, 
you are comparing the lives of Coco Chanel, actually Gabriele Chanel, and a Russian woman, Polina Jemchuchina, who um, uh, was the wife of uh, famous uh, minister Molotov. And uh, you described her importance for the Soviet uh, perfume industry. Can you, uh, since we know more generally speaking about Coco Chanel, can you tell us a little uh, bit about this Polina and why she was so uh, central to the perfume yeah. Yeah. world? Yeah. Uh, Polina came in to this story because I discovered, it was for me a surprise, that the wife of Molotov, we know him very well as a prominent uh, and very important person, but uh, that Polina, his wife, was central for the reconstruction and for the, uh, for the perfume and cosmetic industry, that was new for me. And so I tried to find out uh, the main uh, phases of her, of her career. Uh, she is a bit uh, younger than Coco Chanel, but uh, I was interested, I mean, about uh, Coco Chanel, we have dozens of books. We have no biography up to now about, uh, about uh, Polina Shemchuzina Molotova, uh, and it will be necessary to make one. But there are some parallels. Uh, both came from rather simple or humble uh, social uh, situation, origin. Uh, both uh, were very active, uh, self-conscious, very um, active. Uh, they made their way up to the top of influence and, and power. And um, Polina Shemchuzina, she came from a Jewish family in a city close to Yekaterinoslav, today uh, Ukraine. And she was active during revolution, uh, civil war. She went underground and she went to Moscow where she was active in the uh, women's, uh, women movement propaganda among women. And in the early 20s, she got to know uh, Molotov, but at the same time, she was, uh, uh, she was director of uh, this um, uh, New Dawn, Nobaya Zarya, the factory of perfume. And she made her way up to the, the people commissariat of, and the only woman in, in the leading circle, uh, the People's Commissariat for Light Industry and later on for Fish Industry. So she made her way up to the top of power. She lived with Molotov in the inner circle in the Kremlin. And there's a parallel, uh, I would say, uh, to Chanel, who made also her way. She was not depend she made her way into the high society of Paris, uh, London and uh, to the top of, uh, of the power and up to, to the point that uh, during the occupation, the German occupation of Paris, she worked together with the occupation forces. She had a lover from the diplomatic corps, the German diplomatic corps in, in Paris. And she was uh, accused uh, after the war uh, for having uh, relations to, uh, to the German uh, occupation forces. But the fates of two of these two persons, they parted ways uh, uh, at the end. Uh, Polina was accused in the late 40s when uh, Stalin launched his, uh, his campaign against uh, so-called cosmopolit cosmopolitans against Zionist and imperialist uh, forces inside the Soviet Union. She was accused in 1948 and she, she was sentenced for five years and banished uh, to uh, Kustanay, which is behind the Urals in, in Kazakhstan. And she was there for five years and there was prepared a show trial with her. But uh, we have now the interrogations, she never conceded any of these, uh, these fantastic accusations. And uh, she came free a couple of days 
uh, 10th of, of March 1953, Beria personally came to her when she was uh, in Lubyanka uh, in herself, and he told her, you are free, you can go. And he, Beria told her that Stalin uh, died uh, a couple of days before, and she was so shocked, uh, she could not believe. And uh, we had to say that uh, up to the end of her life in the 70s, she was a true believer of uh, Stalin and she was uh, uh, very, yeah, she was not only uh, uh, together with Molotov up uh, to her end, but she was really a Stalinist, con a uh, convinced a Stalinist person. And yeah. this is a problem how, uh, person who had this fate could remain a Stalinist believer. It's actually incredible because uh, under the purchase under Stalin, she also lost a brother and sister. So yeah. how is it psychologically even possible and also given her own uh, history that she uh, states a believer in Stalin? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a central question, not only of uh, of this privileged uh, high society right. person, but it's a question of a generation who went through uh, this uh, Stalin time, which is for some people the uh, period of uh, chances of social mobility, upward mobility of making careers, and for hundred thousands and millions away, uh, part of of lost life of being accused, sentenced, and, and, uh, and uh, being in the gulag. So uh, it's a, one of the enigmatic questions we have to address to the Russian history in the 20th century, how this comes together. And it's, mm -hmm. a, 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 it's a great field for, for discussion. Right. right. So we are almost um, um, switching to the Q&A, and please, if you have questions, put them under the Q&A box, which is where I will be looking. But before we go there, let me ask you one more question. Uh, after Stalin's death uh, and under, during the period of the so-called thaw under Khrushchev, there was a greater focus on consumer wishes and uh, demands which resulted among other things in uh, new Soviet perfumes conquering the market, but also the import of um, foreign perfumes. And you write that especially in the 1960s and 1970s, these foreign perfumes actually took over the markets. Can you explain or tell us why it was that these uh, foreign brands became more popular than the Soviet brands? Yeah. Um... Asking uh, people, uh, I would say, of my generation now being about uh, around 70, uh, asking women what perfumes they liked. They all would say when they were young in the 60s, 70s, they could not uh, bear this perfume of Red Moscow. It was for, for them, it was a babushki uh, perfume. Uh, a perfume of grandmothers and old ladies. And so the generational gap and clash between the generation of, of the Thaw and the older was even marked in the sandscape in, and in the controversies about fragrances. The young generation desired to find perfumes from Poland, from Jiria, or from Lebanon or Egypt. And um, there was always a kind of black market for, for Western perfumes, which were, of course, very, very expensive. And um, uh, you could observe in the late 80s at the agony of the Soviet Union, uh, one of the most uh, important subjects uh, in these uh, bazaars and uh, flea markets and black uh, markets all over the empire were uh, perfumes. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, that uh, Red Moscow lost its popularity was a kind of 
of um, symbolizing or indicating the agony of, of the late uh, Soviet Union. And it's not so, uh, or it's quite clear why uh, the, the factory Novaya Zarya did not survive the first years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And all these uh, uh, global brands were moving into the former Soviet Union and opening their shops and uh, in, in the shopping centers, etc. But uh, at the end of the 20th century and now, uh, Red Moscow is coming back. And I think this is a very important uh, indicator uh, showing that uh, with this scent and with this fragrance, uh, associated some memories of uh, a good life uh, in the Soviet Union. It's a kind of uh, uh, search of the lost time in the sense, you, you can say in the sense of Proust, uh, the sense, the scent uh, associated with memories of uh, more or less happy childhood or, or not so happy childhood. Um, yeah, I think, um, and there's a very, a very broad uh, audience in in the internet and in social media discussing all these questions of pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary uh, scents and fragrances, and there's a very uh, active uh, trade with uh, bottles, uh, flacons, uh, etc. And I have even one of these uh, here in. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, yeah, you, you can find it now. Yeah. I have it in my bathroom too, <laughs> thanks <laughs> to your book. <laughs> right. So, uh, by the way, uh, do you know did um, the scent of uh, Red Moscow actually change over the years, or was it pretty constant? Um, I have heard. I d I have no analysis, uh, not a chemical analysis, and even my nose is not as as um, as trained to to find out the differences but from uh, russian books and from experts on this subject i know that they said that there are several generations of red moscow and that the latest uh, editions of uh, of red moscow will not have very much in common with the original i see yeah since we still don't have um, any questions under the Q&A, um, I would like to expand a little bit on, uh, on what you mentioned about the relaunching of Red Moscow and how it relates to a kind of nostalgia towards the Soviet Union. Would you say that's part of a broader pattern where um, a significant number of people living in Russia or maybe also other former Soviet republics uh, start to romanticize the past, see the positive aspects of life under the Soviet Union, and maybe even develop a kind of longing for that lost period? Uh, I think there are both uh, tendencies. And I mean, we are now in a time where there is going on a very hard struggle how to interpret uh, the post-Soviet uh, uh, situation in, in Russia and uh, how to evaluate the Soviet experience. And um, uh, I think there's a, a great interest uh, on one hand side uh, to re reinterpret or to, to reanalyze or take up again the subject how to evaluate. For instance, it's not only about fragrances, it's about style, for instance. You have uh, in Russia now uh, uh, skyscrapers in the global international style, but you have also a Stalin style um, uh, skyscraper in Leningrad Chassis in, in Moscow. Uh, you have uh, uh, there's an interest, an interest uh, in dealing with this story, but very controversial and antagonistic and uh, with, uh, how to say, with uh, censorship. I mean, there's an official uh, policy of how to interpret uh, the past, and there is an uh, independent uh, 
uh, approach, uh, for instance, uh, institutions or associations like Memorial, who are trying to to re to research the history of of the camps, uh, who are collecting databases about the victims, uh, who are collecting biographies, documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And on the other hand, um, there are um, how to say um, it's um, it's forbidden to to have a free discourse on certain questions. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, when did World War the Second World War start? Was it in uh, 1939? Uh, was it only the Great uh, Patriotic War? Um, how to evaluate the molotov ribbentrop uh, 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 contract, et cetera. So uh, there is going on a process of discussion, of controlling the discussion, of, dis of censoring the discussion. And uh, I'm sure that uh, also the history of of the perfume will uh, will be taken on the agenda. We need, for instance, biographies of people who have uh, people who have uh, uh, built up the perfume industry. We need uh, biographies of, uh, for instance, of Auguste Michel, who created. Uh, created Red Moscow, the French perfumer who disappeared in the 1930s. And we don't know even up to now what his fate was. Did he disappear uh, during the, the Stalin's purges? Uh, became he victim uh, of, of the purges? Uh, did he just disappear in, uh, in the vast uh, spaces of, of the Soviet empire. So we need a lot of, or we just have to, to open the archives of, of the factory which created uh, the perfumes. I have not seen, uh, and um, uh, I tried to go to this place, but in the last year, uh, it was due to pandemic impossible right, to go. The, the same as uh, the Osmotik in Paris was also closed uh, because I wanted to see the bottles of the Brocard and Raleigh uh, fragrances. Right, thank you. We have a question from Catherine Sire. She writes, thank you, Carl, for a fascinating and nuanced discussion of the role of scent in Soviet Russian history. I'm struck by your mention of scent and memory and how those associative meanings might be less than trans transparent, positive, negative, or both. If there is resurgent consumer interest in Red Moscow, I'm curious as to how it is marketed nowadays. Hmm. Uh, I have the impression, I have not made uh, analysis of this, but uh, I know that uh, it's well marketed now uh, in, uh, in the online, online trade. And I had even the impression that the book I have written was contributing to a surge of, <laughs> of uh, selling uh, this perfume. And we have, um, we have um, uh, departments or, uh, of, um, of the, the factory, the company in Moscow, for instance, which is also, uh, also working in, in Berlin. And I tried to get in contact with this uh, this uh, branch of of the Red Moscow factory, but I was not uh, I I did not manage it. it. It was impossible to to get in contact. But uh, if you go to the websites, to the home pages of this of uh, of uh, New Dawn, uh, Novaya Zarya, you can find a lot a great uh, assortment of, of, of perfumes and you can order them uh, at any place in the world. So I have the impression that uh, there's uh, quite a good market for this. Right, 
Another question is from Marty Zisner. He writes, are the Russian glass perfume containers unique to Soviet design or are they copies of Czech or French approaches? Uh, that's a, a very interesting uh, question I would like to, to follow, but I'm now working on entirely different things. But uh, I have to say that the design of the Red Moscow from 1924, 25, it was made by one of the um, uh, uh, one of the uh, expressionist and uh, modernist designers uh, and making uh, glass bottles, and um, and so uh, they tried to to go away from the pre-revolutionary design of of Halle and and Brocard and to find a modern form. They they tried uh, the same as Chanel. Uh, she created also a very simple, laconic. Um, uh, geometric uh, form uh, of the bottle, of the bottle. Uh, so, um, if you go to to books which have been published, there are, for instance, two volumes uh, about the perfume uh, perfume albums of, of the perfume industry in in the Soviet Union. Uh, you can be fascinated by the explosion of ideas they had in the 50s and 60s to find new new forms and uh, to find original forms and not to make a copy of the Western brands. And um, uh, in my book, I have uh, uh, two or three of these uh, uh, pictures. No, they tried to develop their own uh, design and the 50s and 60s especially were a very uh, a time of search for new for new forms, right. independent. There is actually a question here that directly relates to it. Has the Packaging of Red Moscow remained consistent over the decades, or has the logo evolved? No, uh, no, no. They have changed. And for instance, um, uh, one of the readers of my book, a lady of 85 years, she sent me a bottle I never have seen. And she said she bought it uh, in the 50s, which is uh, of a Red Moscow, which is entirely different from the bottle I have now, uh, which I ordered in, in last year. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, some variations, but uh, you can find uh, the different lines and, and examples of the uh, Red Moscow uh, easily in on the homepage of, of Red Moscow. Right. Thank you. Uh, it's about, uh, oh, let's do one final question, uh, which is from Hans Rindisbacher. Perfume in the Soviet Union was always also an alcoholic beverage, notably the men's cologne, Troinoi. And working in the archives, you realize that there is a constant complaint by perfumers about the disappearance on, or non-arrival of the alcohol for the perfume making process. Any interesting anecdotes along those lines for Krasnaya Moskva, for Red Moscow? Yeah. Um, uh, only at the end of my research and writing, I realized that the alcohol question is related to the perfume the question. Of course, reading newspapers and traveling a lot in the Soviet Union, I knew that uh, all the time uh, were victims of drinking sprit of alcohol and, and other things. Uh, but I have to, uh, to admit that dealing with perfumes and with bottles of perfume, I did not have the idea, but which is necessary to, to follow this idea that the perfume question really is 
very connected, related to the alcohol question and uh, independent uh, from the, uh, the Soviet and the Russian cases that now uh, it's quite clear that uh, most of the companies producing fragrances and perfumes are, are now in during the pandemic uh, working now on disinfection and 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 uh, uh, means of for uh, for disinfection and working um, and using their chemical ingredients for creating for creating stuff uh, in fighting for against uh, uh, against uh, COVID nineteen. So uh, it's quite clear that there is this relation, but I have to admit that when I, I was working on this book, I had not this, um, uh, uh, it, it was not on the table, this, this question, not yet, right. maybe right. in the second edition. Right. Uh, it's about uh, time to wrap up, but I would uh, love to ask you one final question. You mentioned your new uh, forthcoming book, which is about American sites of memory, the memoir. I'm so curious to hear what role smell and scent play in your new book. Yeah. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, question. Uh, there is, there is uh, the Chanel question in because uh, in the time capsule, which was uh, dig uh, and buried in the ground of World Fair 1939 in New York, Queens, Flushing Meadows, in this time schedule, uh, capsule was not only uh, the, the text of the speech of, of Roosevelt and text of Thomas Mann and uh, Albert Einstein, but also Chanel number no. five. And to show uh, the generation uh, 5,000 years after uh, which uh, life we in our time had. So there is this link, but uh, serious, your question is very important uh, because of course there is a sense in in America too, and just working about uh, shopping malls, mm -hmm. uh, these there are soundscapes created artificially. There are soundscapes. These are visual uh, landscapes uh, for uh, for people moving into these uh, in, into these architectural landscapes and inventions of the American civilization created by an Austrian refugee in the 30s, Victor Grün. And yes, they were also um, experts creating sandscapes for uh, shopping malls. This, but this is just an example. Uh, I, 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 I would like to, to, to make more comments, but not uh, at this occasion now, maybe really? later on. We will just read your book for sure. <laughs> Carl, I want to thank you very, very much for such a fascinating uh, presentation. It was um, great to have you. Yeah. I thank you so much. And I would like to be back sometime in Los Angeles to see what they are doing in Vendor Museum, which I would like to have a Vendor Museum in Berlin. <laughs> I know. Well, you have to come over, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks again. And next week uh, we have a, a new Cold War Spaces interview with Donna Stein about modern art in Iran. And she will speak about her experiences putting together a unique uh, modern art collection for the Tehran uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. So hope to see you next week.